grace to you and peace from God, Abba, Father, Mother, and Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our sibling, brother, and friend, and we said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, here we go. Second week of unfolding the prayer. Let's do a little recap and see if you remember what we talked about last week. What did we talk about? Abba, Father, right? We talk about Abba and Father. We talk about also that the Lord's Prayer, the version of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel according to Luke, is the shorter version that we have in the Scripture between Matthew and Luke. And possibly this prayer in the, in the Gospel according to Luke, it is uh, older than the version that we read in the Gospel according to Matthew. We also talk about the place, the important place where the evangelist places the Lord's Prayer in the, in the Gospel according to Luke, which is right after the stories of the good Samaritan that tells us and reminds us of our call to love who? Our neighbor. And then we have the story also of Mary and Martha, and this is the story where the Lord Jesus and the evangelist reminds us of the relationship that we are to look for with God, with Jesus, to listen the message and to hear and to allow that message to become part of us. So that's what we were talking about last week and the importance of the word Abba in Aramaic that does not, or let me ask you, let me put in a, in, a, in a question because I'm supposed to be asking you questions, not giving you the answers. So does the, does the uh, word Abba in Aramaic conveys any gender? It is about a relationship. It is about the intimate relationship of God with all creation, with you and with me. So let's remember that because it's important for us to understand the rest of the, of the prayer. But today we are going to focus on the, uh, what David was uh, sharing here with our young worshipers. That specific line where we talk about um, holiness. Now, I want to say that during this, se this series, you will hear me sharing stories about my own personal experience in learning about the meaning of this prayer, my own personal wrestling with these words and how I believe that the Spirit has led me. Not because I believe that my story or my experience is better than yours. I believe that if we have the time, we will hear hundreds of stories on how the Spirit is working in your lives and in your journeys to teach you, to lead you, and to embrace this prayer. But I hope that this experience that I'm sharing with you can help you and to be a catalyst in your hearts to start thinking on how yourself you are thinking about how this prayer touches you in a special ways. Years ago when I was in, in, in Sunday school, I remember that one of the ways that I learned the Lord's Prayer and they, that helped me to remember was that the Lord's Prayer has basically three sections. And maybe you, some of you learned this. The first section is one introduction, six petitions, and one conclusion. Did any one of you learn that? Well, I was the only one then. <laughs> but, well, as I have said to you, I, I grew up in a congregation that was um, more conservative in the theological interpretation of the scriptures. So it was very important that everything had a structure and they had to memorize it. So I memorized, I learned by heart the Lord's Prayer, remembering this, one introduction, six petitions, and one conclusion. And today we are going to reflect on the, one of these first petitions. Now, let me say that this structure it helped me, but at the same time, it become um, rigid because then it becomes almost like mechanical. Almost that I say, and I don't know if it happens to you when, you when you pray the Lord's Prayer, that sometimes we do it and it comes just like mechanically, instantly. 
and sometimes we, not, we do not have the time to reflect in the words. Last Wednesday, for example, in the Bible study, one of the participants, one of our sisters in the Bible study was telling us that the, Bible, that the uh, Lord's Prayer, perhaps, it's a prayer that we can pray that can last one day or one week or one month. Why? Because if we are going to pray this story maybe by saying, Abba, Father, we can spend an hour or a day or a week reflecting in what that means in our lives. When we say, let your, let, your, um, let your name be hallowed, we can reflect for a day or for a week. So I invite you to start thinking in terms on how this prayer, it is, as we said last Sunday, it is not something that we just do because it's in our books, something that I learned with these words that cannot be changed but it is a guide on how you and I reflect in our daily lives that really intimate relationship that you and I experience in our lives. The first petition is, let your name be hallowed. That is the direct translation from the Greek. Let your name be hallowed. Now, as David was inviting us to think, what does the hallowed word mean in our lives? in our language today. Anyone? Sacred? Sacred. Revere. Revere. Holy? Set aside. set aside, set apart. Right? We need to remember, and we know this in our daily lives, in order for us to set something aside, to set something apart, to set something as special in our lives, the truth is that you and I need to know a little bit of the value of that person or anything that belongs to us or that is given to us. Knowing the value, knowing the worth, knowing what is behind may give a special value in order for us to put it aside. The other aspect is that there needs to be a personal connection with that person or with that object. Don't you do that? Don't you put that on your shelves, on your walls, on your desks, or maybe on your bodies? Anything that has a special value, you place it in a place that brings you the comfort, the guidance, the joy, and that brings you fulfillment in your life. Holiness can mean sanctified, honor, make uncommon, make something special, and being claimed by God. The whole liturgy that we read just a minute ago, it is really an explanation and expansion of this understanding of holiness in our lives. But at the same time, my sisters, my siblings in Christ, I want to be realistic that when we talk about holiness, there is an element of fear, isn't it? If God is holy, are we holy? I think that holiness of God brings both fear in our hearts because we cannot comprehend it, but at the same time, it brings a sense of being enfolded in their arms, in the heart, in the bosom of our God, our Abba. Holiness brings us and draws us to God's self. And that's why you and I are part of the household of God. This fear I believe that is a fear that I lived with many, for many years in my life. And this reverence that sometimes led me to fear, this response to God out of fear. I always felt that God was so holy that I was unworthy, that others were unworthy in church, and especially those who were not Christians. It was hard for me to see in others the holiness of God because I believed that God was so separated from us 
that there was no a possibility for us to ever experience that closeness and that holiness with others. Years ago, when I was doing my internship in Austin, Texas, I started my internship this in the, during the last year of my four years of seminary. And a month after I started my internship, the supervisor, the pastor, presented his resignation because he was taking another call. So here you have this international student in a Texan congregation, <laughs> this international student learning English, and Texas was not the best place, but because there was an accent that was hard for me, it was different from my English in the classrooms, but it was in Austin, I was by myself, and all of a sudden, I'm in charge of the congregation. And then, it was hard for me because at that time, my daughter was born. My mother-in-law came from uh, Taiwan with Jade and with me to help us. And one day when I was serving communion, people were coming to receive communion. You can imagine, again, this international student now serving a congregation by himself, learning English and start, trying to understand theology. And nervous, I started giving communion and going around giving communion to people. And you know when you are nervous and when you are doing, you start doing things really not paying attention to what comes next. You just want to focus on what you are doing right now there. And then I see these hands. And when I lift my eyes, it is the hands of my mother-in-law. Now, by that time, my mother-in-law was planning to go to the monastery to continue to study in Buddhism and possibly to become a monk. This pastor, grown up in a congregation where holiness was, uh, the holiness of God was something that created more fear, filled myself. But it was too late. I was given communion, the holy body of the Lord Jesus Christ that nobody who is unworthy should take if he doesn't confess before and accept Jesus Christ. The bread was in her hand. I didn't know what to do. And for days, I struggled. Was the holiness of God and the fear of God going to punish her and me for doing that? In the gospel according to Luke, prayer and the Holy Spirit are fundamental. Prayer moves us from relationship to action. You and I already live in the love of Abba, our mother, father, and creator. Mary, this young woman who also thought perhaps that she was unworthy to bring and to be the channel and the instrument of God to bring our Savior, that day when the Spirit spoke to her, when God in God's holiness came to her to remind her that even she, young, unworthy, and maybe somebody who was not qualified to reflect the holiness of God said, you are going to bear a child, and his name will be Jesus. And in that relationship, in that embrace of the holiness, the love of Abba, Father, Mother, Creator, Mary responds by saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. Because even though I am a little person here, you have come to me. And it is in that holiness my sisters, my siblings, my brothers in Christ, that I invite you to abide today. I understood that 
Because after 10 years, my mother-in-law called us and told us, well, told Pastor Jay, because I don't understand Chinese, of course. <laughs> and Jay told me what my mother-in-law said and said, I found a church. I am going to be baptized. Out of curiosity and after struggling many years trying to understand what that horrible mistake that I made by giving communion, the holy body of the Lord Jesus Christ, to an unworthy person who was not even Christian. I asked Jade and I said, can you ask your mom how come she decided to be baptized and to join a church? And my mom-in-law said, And this is the part where I understand the holiness to which you and I are called. She said, that day when I received the bread, I was touched. And for these 10 years, I realized the holiness and the love of God for me. My soul, our soul, magnifies the Lord. Because even though we may think that we are unworthy and unholy, you and I are called to be the instruments of that grace, of that intimate love of Abba, our Father our mother, our creator. God doesn't need our assistance or support to be holy. Rather, God gives us our existence to be holy every day by reflecting God's holiness. God, at the same time, chooses not to be God without you, without me, without all creation. May this love of God, of Abba, be hallowed through our lives as a congregation. Let this prayer change us and lead us to become and to tap into the presence of holy love in each one of us.